you know, I, I can treat them individually. But if, if it's increasing polynomially, you can't use a technique like this. So, so these, the, the, the people are getting more and more, there's a lot of people with a large number of edges. So this is related to this heavy tail um, distribution. And this is um, related to like, so this is sometimes called the power law um, property of degrees. Um, okay. Um, so, so, so these are kind of some, some cool things about graphs that we've discovered in the last uh, like decade or so now that we can gather these large um, social networks. And so these were just questions people had, had kind of wanted to know um, and weren't able to, to answer um, uh, just because they didn't have the data. Um, so before, there was like this popular model of graphs um, called the Erdos uh, um, Rainey model. Um, and so this was that um, you have n nodes and, and you have a p, so it's sometimes called an np graph, where there's some dual form. But, and then each edge is chosen uh, randomly with, with probability p. Right, so each edge is chosen randomly and independently. Um, so, so, so you choose each, each edge has equal probability of being there. And so there was this huge study, um, I guess a lot of this was even in the 70s and, and 80s, um, since, so something back more, but saying when you change the value p, what sort of properties did the graph have? And you see that at some value of p it became connected, you know, at some point you have one large, smaller than that you have one large component, that was all very, and a lot of edges, and then a few things that didn't have any edges. At a certain point, you start to get cycles. And there are lots of properties that you see when you use this model. But this model does not have a lot of these other things. It did not have this polynomially decreasing degree sequence. Um, it did, um, its longest diameter was not shrinking uh, as n grew. As p grew, that is true but not as the size of the graph group. Um, so, and, and, uh, and so this is kind of saying that there's some model C, that there's, there's some linear function that the edges are growing. That corresponds with the P. Right. Um, so th th this model, people don't, you know, there's still some mathematicians who look at this, but in, in modeling these graphs, they, there, there are other models people look at. There's some, um, built, try to build on this preferential attachment where you assign a certain probability of joining, you add edges one by one, and you, you try and join them um, more likely if, if they have a common neighbor, and even more likely if they have more than one common neighbor, right? The bigger the clique that they're growing, the more likely they are to, to form. But this doesn't quite have a lot of the properties that we've seen in, in real graphs. Um, the kind of, the most popular model now um, um, is called the Kronecker product model. And there are some people who are starting to say that this is no longer, um, you know, there, there are some weird things wrong with this. And that's true, but it, it, sas it satisfies all of these properties. And this is basically by um, Leskovic. Um, so there are other people on some of these papers. but. He was the main driver of this. And so what this model said is that, uh, um, so who's heard of a Kronecker product? Okay. Uh, okay, maybe I won't describe this in full, but a Kronecker product of a matrix, um, so let's say this is A, B, C, D, and this is E, F, G, H. This is gonna be equal to a E, A B, A C, uh, A C, A D. Um, this is. Wait, hold on. Uh, a E, A F, A G, A H. The 
this is C, E, C, F, C, G, C, H. All these start with B, and all these start with D. But, so you take this graph and you stick four copies of it. You, for each entry here, you multiply this whole graph. So I mean, if this was two by two and two by two, now this is four by four. If this was two by two and this was three by three by four, then this one is then this one would now be six by eight. Right? You're you're making so so this one is spread out and this one is making four copies of it. Okay. So now, how's this um, how's this relate to how's this relate to graphs? Well, you need to think of the graph now as this matrix, and you need to think of these these uh, these entries as um, as either a zero or one if an edge is there. Now, if we took a set of if there are some edges, and then you generate a graph by doing some sort of Kronecker product with some smaller graphs together. Now, if you did it with the zero one, then you only keep an edge if it's there in, in both parts. Um, but this makes too much um, uniformity in the graph. So what you do is you put a probability of an edge in each of these four locations and in each of these four. And then you get four, four different locations, you multiply the probabilities, and then you flip a coin based on these probabilities to generate edges in the graph. And you can string together some set of these. Maybe you choose string together five or or eight of these, depending on how big the graph grows. It grows exponentially for every one of these these kind of products. And you need they need to all be square for it to make sense. To do that. Okay, so um, so this is the model of the chronic product graph, and it it somehow satisfies just it can be made to satisfy all the different properties here, right? So 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 why is it important to have a model for these graphs? Well, so, um, so, um, so who here did a, pro a project on looking at the uh, looking at the Facebook graph? Did anyone do a project looking at um, the graph of the of who's following who on Twitter? No, because those companies don't let you have that information, right? That's very yes, you have it now. Facebook just allowed access to it, but it's only for selected developers. Right, right. So they, they will allow sometimes they'll allow very restricted access to this. Right? This is the actual graph structure is a real commodity. Yeah. Right? That's why Facebook's valuation is so high. Maybe not as high as people thought it was going to be, but it's still very high because they have this, all these connections, they understand the relationship between these people. Right? So this is a very valuable commodity, but in order to do research on this new pool of data, you know, you can't necessarily get access to these, these graphs. So I um, um, so um, when I was a grad student I um, I did an internship at uh, on Yahoo Research and um, Yuri Leskovic was was interning there at the same time. And, and this was like several years ago. I didn't realize the the, um, the usefulness of this. But he was there analyzing all of the internal graphs they have. He couldn't publish with them, but he was going and calculating these properties of the smaller social networks that they had within within Yahoo, and analyzing and testing out certain hypotheses about these. Um, and so inside these companies, you have some access to this. Um, but in, in academics, people trying to study this, you just don't don't have access to these. So you want to create these models that match the properties so then you can generate these and run your experiments on them. Right? It's also important in um, statistics where you want to generate some um, sort of null hypothesis about something. And so th these, you could, these properties are some ideas of some null hypothesis you could generate, but you, ha you want to have some kind of random baseline. If, if you look at all graphs, you know, I had written some paper when I was in grad school, and we kind of used the Erdos Schrenge model as as a as a random graph as a backdrop. But really, we should be using something more like this. It's more um, realistic of the average sorts of graphs that are out there. So, if you want to look at a population of, of graphs that could have come from this this thing and test some statistic you found versus a random graph, 
then you should be using something like this chronic recovery. Okay, uh, how are we doing? Okay, so all right. So the, the next thing. So okay. So, so so now I was supposed to talk about um, um, communities and graph and kind of importance of things. And so I could go off on these kind of tangents for, for, for two reasons. So one. So one way of finding um, these communities is to do clustering, right? And we know how to do clustering at graphs, or one way how to do clustering at graphs. You can use um, spectral um, clustering. So I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a different view that's used on graphs um, soon, but I'm also going to talk about um, the, um, the, the importance of certain of certain nodes and edges of the graph. How important are these for different aspects? Right? If you look at if you look at this graph, you can kind of see that this edge is really the connection between this group and this group. But on a larger graph, it's going to be hard to see these sorts of things. There may be, you know, between here and Russia, right? There's not going to be just one person who can talk across. There are going to be thousands of people. But thousands is small compared to yeah. So how do you really and, and ahead of time, you may not know. Maybe the, the issue is not, you know, um, U.S. versus Russian. It's either, you know, uh, it's based on what religion the people are, right? That may be a better separator. And you don't know these things ahead of time, so you want to find them. So, um, so we already know something about the importance of nodes, right? How important are certain nodes in the graph? Um, so this was page rank. Right, so you can you can run the Markov chain on on the graph and get the important nodes based on the page rank of those the importance based on their page rank or you know in the in that limiting distribution where is a random person going to be on on the graph? Okay, so, so but now I'm going to talk about a different view here um, um, called betweenness, and so betweenness, so you can calculate the betweenness of an edge, and you can adjust this to be for a node as well. But, the, but it's going to be the, um, the, the fraction of um, shortest paths using um, on this edge. Um, so, um, so this is the between us. You can, you can just say the number of shortest paths. So this is looking at a shortest path in between two nodes on the graph. We're going to look at all pairs of nodes. And if a lot of shortest paths go through an edge, it means it must really be connected. Right? So if I look here, how many shortest paths are I'm going to use this edge? So it's, it's, it's not going to be, so, okay, here's an easier one. How many shortest paths can use this edge? Every single one. No. So it, it, it's going to be n minus 1, right? So that there, there are going to be um, n choose 2 shortest paths, right? So this is n times n minus 1 over 2, right? So this is the number of shortest paths. And n minus one of them will use this edge because they're going to come out of this node, and anything with including this node is going to have a shortest path that goes through this edge. Right. Okay. Um, how about um, how about this one? Uh, yeah, Th this edge here. Yeah, I didn't label them, but. Right, so, oh, so this one's a little bit trickier um, because from 5 to 2, 
there are two shortest paths. Either go this way from down to three and up or up to four. So in that case, we want to say it gets half credit for that. From five to two, it gets one half shortest path that goes through this edge. Okay. Um, so that means that every shortest path, if you if you ignore three and four, every other shortest path going through five gets puts half of its weight here. And so um, and then if it goes to three, it gets all the way. If it goes to four, it gets it gets none of its weight. So so this one, so well, this one is. So this one is n minus one. This one is going to be n minus one over two. It's going to be even smaller. Okay. Um, how about this one here? You don't have to tell me exactly, but tell me how you would. So how many edges it's going to be? So if I have any node from here in this half and any node from this half, they have to use this edge, right? So, so this is going to be um, okay. n over 2. Um, so n over 2 choices times n over 2, right? If it's right in the middle. In this case, it's going to be 4 times 4. Right? So is that, no, no, that's not right. Sorry. Uh, if I'm going to get um, yeah, yeah, um, that was right. Right, so this is going to have 16 choice paths. Okay, so I can choose four here, and for each one of these choices, anything over here, the shortest path has to go through here. So this one is going to have a very high value between us. This one is going to be low, and this one's going to be even lower. Right, so this one is smaller than this one because if I disconnected this edge, this node is completely gone, is not connected. If I disconnected this edge, I can still get to someplace using, um, I can still get someplace based on this, uh, this from five by going to this other edge. And often in the, the same amount of time. So is that measuring like the center? So it kind of measures what is the center of the graph. Yeah. So the edges more in the center that really connect things are have a higher between the score. So it's um, between the score of the edge is greater than some number of that fit between that edge with this connection. Uh, there may be a value for which that's true, but I I don't I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it's probably, if, if it's greater than, than n squared over 4, it's probably true. Well, that one. But that's kind of an error. But this is also true here, so I can't say that necessarily. Right? This edge may have a high between us, may be larger than n minus 1. But if I, dis if I remove this, I haven't disconnected the graph. Yeah. Do every, does every edge have? Um, in between in between the scores, such as the the edges that aren't even part of the shortest path in any in any sort of way. Um, I guess like I guess if you remove some of the edges, then they'll eventually be part of the shortest path. But is there a way to evaluate them before those edges are removed? Well, so can any edge have a between the score of zero? Uh, no, why not? So which edge might have a between the square of 0? 4, 3. 4, 3. What's the shortest path between 4 and 3? Right, so every edge must be at least one shortest path. So if you have one that's less than 9, you know, if there are two paths, two edges. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess you could do that. Um, if you had multiple edges, yeah. Um, then it could be less than, less than 1. Um, yeah, I've seen it defined either the fraction of the edges or the total number. So, um, but yeah, so so, but but generally everything will have will have some non-zero between the scores. So it's it's well defined in some sense. Okay, so this is this is a useful property. For instance, how would you find the communities in a graph or clusters in a graph? 
uh, using this between the score and all entities. Cut the highest edges. So if I, d does that necessarily give me a separation of the graph? So that's um, that's basically right. Um, okay. So 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 it's basically you want to um, what you want to do is remove the edges with the really high between the score um, up to some threshold, and then every other connected component would then be a cluster. Right, so that's a way of finding clusters or communities, right? So, um, you know, the, the edges between the US and Russia, you know, um, might reply but very high between the score. Um, and so if, if you removed all of those, then you would separate Russia from the US. Um, okay, so, so how would you calculate um, the between the score for all the edges on the graph? So would you, so you would individually calculate all the shortest paths. So there's this, so, so, so a lot of you have taken algorithms, right? Or, yeah. Uh, but so you, you know there's this all pair shortest path? So you, you can calculate, you can calculate all shortest paths from a single node um, by doing just a depth first search. And you do this from all nodes and you get all, all the shortest paths between all nodes. And this is, is it then like Bevanford or? I should, I should know what it's called. Uh, the extra is like Bevanford or like or all the extras of power. So, so, so it, yeah, so I think you want to use. Well, they're both those, both those are just pathways. Yeah. You just need to jump through search. Oh, so the Dijkstra is the one on finds all shorts. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, it's the single source. So, so four is the yeah, then four, four is four. the one with the higher complexity. So I think that does right. Uh, so, so if you do if you do dijkstra's, right? So, it's, so what you do is you is you run dijkstra's, and so from from this starting point, you're going to get shorts path tree that looks like this, and then you're not going to have this edge. And so you're not going to have this, and you're going to get it. Uh, right, so, this, so, so what you want to do is, but these are top, so you want to keep all tops. So, so you want to find the, so do this from each node. From each node, find the, all the shortest paths, and keeping all ties going forward. And then you want to walk back up, right? You start from, from every node, and you walk up. And if it's, you start from all the leaf nodes, so you start from five and eight, which are leaf nodes. And five has two paths going out, so you split and you put one half on each of these edges. And then you pick up an extra node, and you put, and so now you put one and a half on both of these edges. And now they combine together, and you picked up an extra node, so you get three plus one, and you get, um, so four on this edge. You get five on this edge, one here, and you get six on this edge. If I did that right, it might be. Maybe I was off by one there. But so you can, you, uh, so the if you look in the if you look in the book, the MMDS book, they describe this in more detail. But you, you build this kind of shortest path tree. And then you can walk it back up and assign weights to each of the edges. And you do this from each starting point. And this will allow you to, to build uh, all the, to, to calculate the betweenness of all the edges. Um, right, yeah, I know. That, that's why I'm, I think I did something wrong. Let's see. Right, yeah, so let's see. One half and one half. One and a half, one and a half. So this was four, this was five, and then six. And it was six plus this one, yeah, so seven. Yeah. So that's what I did. Okay. And, and I did that for this starting point, 
And you do the same for all the starting points and add all these up. So it's, and it, so that handles ties and, and as well at the same time. So it's a little tricky, but you could probably implement it. But the problem is this is still a pretty uh, slow algorithm. And uh, you, know, you need to do this for each starting point. So it's going to be at least quadratic in the number of nodes. Because for each starting point, you hit all the nodes. So this is a very expensive algorithm. So to do this on a large graph is not going to be feasible. You have a billion nodes, you're not going to be able to run this. So, so it's, as, far, as far as I know, it's kind of an open question how to approximate the between this score well, or how to calculate this more quickly. This is a very, it's a very useful property to understand the importance of certain edges. And people have tried various sampling approaches in order to do this. Um, and they work, some of them work kind of OK, but they don't work you know, that great. Um, all right, so this, so, um, so, so this between us is a really useful property, but it's kind of slow to calculate and hard to approximate. Okay, um, so let me say one more thing about finding um, communities and graphs, and that's the idea of modularity. Um, and so this is kind of a, this actually, actually comes from the, um, um, from the physics community somehow. Um, and it's kind of a statistical property of how good a cluster is or how good a clustering of the graph is. Right? And so, um, So if you look at the, the modularity of a cluster, which is going to be a set of a set of vertices, it's going to be a, about this is kind of a rough way of thinking about it. The, the the fraction of edges in in the cluster minus the expected. Um, fraction in the cluster. Right, so how do you how do you know what the expected fraction is? So what you do is the the expected. Um, so, um, so if you look at edge E with with vertices I and J, um, a and you look at the degree of of of, of vertex i, so call this vi, right? Then you say that the expected number of, of edges in, in this edge, right? It's going to be either 0 or 1, but what is the expected, what's essentially the probability that there's an edge there, is going to be um, um, the degree over i over, over n. Uh, is times the degree over j times two times the number of edges. So that means that um, so, um, so if you're looking at all possible, so you're basically saying. An edge came from vertex i, also came from vertex j. Now, if you if you look at if you count up all the degree of all the edges, you're going to count all the edges twice, right? The sum, let's see, um, the sum over i of di is equal to two times the number of edges, right? Because each edge is, is is attached to two vertices, right? So this is the total number of edges. And this is the probability that it came from di uh, on the from dj. So this is the expected um, this is the expected value of each of these edges. Okay. Um, and so now you look at the fraction of edges in a cluster. Um, so so then you can also define 
So and then this EIJ is now a matrix filled with probabilities. And you have this AIJ, which is, is going to be the actual, are there edges there or not? Um, So then um, the modularity of a clustering, which is measured over the entire graph, but once you've broken up into, into clusters, is Which, which all pairs, which are in the, which are in the cluster, um, you do AIJ minus. Here. So if, if you calculate this, this tells you if you have a clustering on the graph, how good this clustering is, how good it captures um, on, on the communities of the graph. So if you have so if you have a cluster like this, um, these edges are in the cluster, and you would expect that. You have a lot more edges, and this, but one edge is missing from the cluster. And this edge, you know, came from this these vertices, but fell outside that. So this is a pretty good um, this is a good cluster because of that. Um, and. Uh, so, and th this gives you a score of how good you found a full clustering on the graph is by adding this to all clusters. Did I get this right, Risa? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and in, in the end, this score is going to be between minus one half and, and one. Um, you can't be bigger than one because you can't have a, um, and the larger it is, the better. Um, you, you can't be bigger than one because it means you would see a lot of these edges, um, and but you wouldn't expect any of them. Um, th this is the dividing through by the proper denominator, so you would get the maximum. Um, and and it, it's easy to, sh I think you, you can see the same way it can't be smaller than minus one. You can actually show it can't be smaller than minus one half. Right, but so if, if the Q value, usually use Q to denote modularity for some reason. If it's in, I, I think a pretty solid range, let me see what I see. If it's in um, 0 0.3 minus 0 0.7, then it means that this is a pretty good structure on the graph. It means you found a good set of communities. Um, it's very rare to get something bigger than 0 0.7. Um, there are some cases where that happens. You can, of course, you know, always design some some graphs. But but if you get in this range, it's 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 already it's, it's already pretty a pretty good structure. Um, smaller than this, it might not be significant. But um, so this is a way of assessing the modularity of or the the clusterness of the graph. Okay. Um, so. So, so this property is defined on a clustering of um, on a clustering of a graph. How would you use this to actually find a good clustering of a graph? How would you help this? How would you use this one function? So, so now we have a function of a given a graph. And a, and a way of dividing up the edges. We have a way of scoring um, how good this is, right? So uh, uh, now, what sort of things can you do? Okay. Yeah. So well, so I'm thinking of something very very simple. Like the first thing you could do is you can you can start with with the uh, with the clustering. And try and move vertices to one cluster or to a different to a different cluster than it's in. And if the modularity score increases, 
then this is a better cluster. Right? You can now run some, some sort of optimization routine on top of this. So you can now try and move, uh, change the clustering incrementally and search just like some sort of gradient descent algorithm to try and find good clusterings in the graph. So, so once you have this global function, which kind of makes sense, then you can kind of do this. When we did, when we were doing spectral clustering, we didn't really have this global function in the same way. It kind of, you know, it's this algorithm, but it's hard to say how good is how good did the algorithm do. We had to stop at some point. This does not depend on, you know, specifically on the number of clusters. Right, so, so this allows us to do different optimization things. You can either try and move one thing at a time, start with a bunch of, you could start with an individual cluster on each node. Um, so you had n different clusters and then try joining them together to increase this. And there, 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 there's, there's various optimization routines um, in order to do this. There, there are ways where you can try and find, so doing these, adding these one at a time turns out to be very slow. But you can kind of do things that kind of speed up, increase this, um, allow this to converge more quickly. Adding things one at a time also tend to get stuck in these local optima, which are not the global optima. But once you define this this uh, this function of how good it is, it kind of gives you a guide of, of, of where to move forward to. And you can try lots of techniques from AI doing like random restarts or you know these hill climbing and so forth to try and find different clusters. One, one more thing I guess I kind of wanted to, to, to talk about. Um, so, so something that's kind of s stuck over from this 19, you know, 50s and 60s view of, of graphs was that the structure and graphs um, were captured in these cliques. So what we want to do is to find these large, these large cliques in graphs. 